let's unveil the first panel discussion of the day. It poses the important question, is AI really beneficial for end users? This panel discussion takes a deep dive into the complex, rapidly evolving world of artificial intelligence. And it brings valuable insights regarding this real world applications and the benefit it brings to the society at large. Please welcome to the session moderator, Mr. Raul Broadjois, <laughs> Vice President of Global Privacy and Data Security at Duff and Phelps who will introduce you to the panelist and take the proceedings forward. Because I think there were a few who were missing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Anne. I will request my fellow panelists to join <laughs> on the dice. Uh, I was informed that there is one person who could not join, so it would be nice, Oliver, Arian. And we'll go over the introductions, just give us a while. <laughs> okay. Ritu. And Neol, Neol Mukherjee. Well, I guess it's three of us. Hello. Best of luck. <laughs> 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 so, so um, we can join us as they come and we'll start yeah, in interest. Okay. Yeah, you can do Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we are hit by a problem and we, we are sorting it out. Uh, in terms of introductions, I'll say uh, it's a topic very dear to me. Uh, Rahul Bhardwaj, as, as just mentioned, I'm CISO for a firm called Kroll. We own multiple brands like Duff and Fell, uh, Prime Clerk, Lucid, and a couple of others. Uh, in terms of services, uh, uh, we are one of the leading valuation service provider uh, through the brand Duff and Felt. Uh, Prime Clerk is uh, leading uh, bankruptcy processing uh, firm in North America. Uh, Lucid, uh, sister concern, does exactly the same across the pond in Europe. Kroll in itself is, is one of the leading cybersecurity brand. Uh, we are one of the largest forensic and incident response firm out there some of the most famous hacks you have been reading, like Marriott Breach and others, were basically identified and still been managed by us. So if you got that call from Marriott stating that we will provide you identity protection and you, you called that number, it eventually ha landed at Kroll and, and it's my team who is supporting you guys. So uh, we use AI uh, a lot in cybersecurity. I will share my own experience. Uh, I think Neil and Gary did a great job in the initial two sessions, setting up the groundwork for us. And I was reading through my fellow panelists. I will have them introduce themselves. And uh, while you're doing so, both of you, if you can just take a moment to talk about in your own product services where you use AI. I think that will be really beneficial. So, sure. Arian. Um, hi, I'm Aria Lila. Uh -oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I, uh, I have a customer data platform that's enabled, that has AI enabled for customers' personas as, as, as well for, uh, for retention pr prediction. Um, what's interesting for, for us and where I look at AI in terms of the end user is also I, I, I am very, or my team and I are very aware and proactive looking at biases and where we en enter biases into our data that can adversely affect populations, um, sp specifically minority and underrepresented groups. Um, that's kind of, that's where my, my marketing 
expertise is really focused. However, I am largely um, informed about how AI is, you know, um, forcing jobs, uh, taking jobs uh, uh, that we need to have right now, and um, we can talk about things like that as well. So, go ahead. Hi. Uh, is that working? Yeah, it is. My name is Olivier Sosak. I'm a founder and CEO of ITL. Uh, we're a Dallas-based uh, MSP service provider, uh, one of the fastest growing and best reviewed uh, um, MSPs uh, in Dallas currently. Um, I do have a pen pending uh, on a smart wearable uh, that we're using AI um, uh, basically integrated into it uh, that's pen pending since 2017. Uh, we're basically saw a big gap between um, how a lot of companies are trying to get the AI dominance basically when we talk about uh, you know like the Google Assistant or when you talk about Alexa um, it, there's still a gap between the consumers and those AI assistant and uh, we believe the product that we're working on is very re revolutionary and uh, as of now there's nothing like it in the market uh, so uh, we'll be very excited to announce more details about it once it becomes publicly available. Hi, Ritu. <laughs> hi. Um, hi, I'm Ritu Malhotra. I'm the founder and CEO of Dialogbox, uh, a company that's uh, bringing uh, automated notes using artificial intelligence, telecom integrations, and experiential design uh, to the mainstream of professionals. Um, we are in the seed stage. Uh, prior to this, uh, 20, uh, I have 20 plus years of experience as an executive. Uh, in product management uh, and uh, you know product strategy at companies like Oracle, Microsoft, and Google Partners, and I started my career uh, working on AI. At the time, it was work; it was used uh, using rules, and now we see that AI is based on uh, data. So it's going to be an interesting discussion. Looking forward to it. Sit down. Yes. <laughs> Let's make it even. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I can go on my side. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Oh, good. Oh, no, no. Okay. And hopefully we will be joined by uh, other two panelists who can share their insights. Uh, uh, group, uh, I'm being the moderator. I would like you guys to throw all the questions you have for us. Uh, and as you can hear from the other members, we have advocates on, on our panel who is going to talk about, uh, I will say, the downside of using AI and, and all the biasness and, and the concerns we have. So, Adrian, I'm going to hit you up with, with those pointers. Uh, we have Ritu out here who has been working and utilizing AI-based rules from very early stages. And Oliver, who has a patent pending, can bring in a lot of insight in terms of how and why it's essential to use AI. Uh, from my personal experience, being a CISO, one of the things which, which any security leader and executive out there will share with you is that we don't have enough people uh, in security field. We, we, if you look at the stats, about 65% of our, our jobs posted never get filled. Uh, by the time we, we train somebody, they move on to the next job and so machine learning, AI algorithms, the product based on that has kept the lights on for us. They have been doing the job which really helped. They have their own share of problem. Uh, my philosophy is that I'm never scared or never get bothered by the intelligence of a machine. Uh, being a CISO, I'm always a bit skeptic and get worried about the stupidity of human being, <laughs> both who are using these machines and, and operating them. Uh, for me, AI and, and reading through about artificial intelligence and usage has been great. I think some of the success story like uh, a Bay-based company, Heartflow, I'm not sure how many of you have read, uh, they came up with, with a simulation model. Uh, one of the major problem in, in medical fraternity was your CT scan will show some fluctuations in your heart, and the only way your doctor can, can help you out was to cut you open. And 
A study showed about 60% of the cases there wasn't an additional action needed, but the procedure was done. Uh, heart flow came up with a 3D modulation, use artificial intelligence, use the same CT scan, provide you a 3D simulated model which can be run with fluids and with about 92% accuracy can now tell you even before an insertion made to your body that you don't have a problem. It's FDA approved, which means that it was tried and tested. Now having that as a success story, as a base, uh, I am always a big proponent that AI is critical if it's used in the right manner. Uh, we will get to the issues, uh, but I think I will set the stage in terms of each one of your view on what's your take on benefits of AI to an end user perspective. Keep it short because it's a very wide area to cover. So, uh, Oliver, can we start with you? Sure, so some of the envisions that uh, a lot of us are gonna be seeing here in the future is AI is gonna be an integral part of everybody's um, lives. For example, um, let's say a school, and you can use AI to teach children. Now, we all know no child is the same. You got some children that are stubborn, you got some ch childs that are just troublemakers, and you got, you know, um, different type of personalities. Um, unfortunately, for a teacher, for example, they can't tell the differences on how to treat one child versus another and what would be the best method of teaching that child. Uh, an AI will be smart enough to, uh, f first of all, diagnose uh, what type of personality that kid has uh, and, and how to address it, how to uh, best teach that child and, and how to give them the best education they can have. This is just one example. Other examples would be, um, let me uh, jump a little bit to the future uh, on some visions of AI. For example, um, uh, let's say growing up, you can have an AI friend. And, and, and I'm talking a little bit here in the future, but imagine uh, an AI friend that's non-biased, uh, that will become your best friend growing up, that will know almost everything about you growing up, and at the same time that can tell when you're sad, when you're depressed, when you have anxiety, and will be able to address that and help you and mentor you. This is all stuff that AI will be able to do in the future that, that right now sounds like science fiction, but we're so close to that, and, and it's right around the corner. And, and trust me, Oliver, it's those kind of story which scares us away from AI, <laughs> having a virtual <laughs> friend. Okay, Arian, what's your take on this? No, I, I agree that that's the, these are the, the doom and gloom um, scenarios that I always think of, especially when you look at attitudes and perceptions, because if you find norms and you try to use these data, first of all, the data is very skewed towards um, white males. So if you have AI scoring all children um, uh, using test data that is skewed towards white males, you're gonna have a problem um. <laughs> well, we, we obviously hope the data set's going to be a like lot bigger than just why males. That's systematic racism, right? And so that, that, that's one of the things that we really need to take into account when we look at these. Um, like, whose ideas matter? And then also, how are you not limit using the AI to limit, uh, limit children, say, for example, so that way that one star can still thrive, you know? Um, because there are always exceptions um, to the rule and we need to be able to recognize that as well um, so, and, not, and not hurt other groups like that. So that's, um, in my opinion, one of the things that we need to do in terms of training AI and kind of like adding guardrails to, to the industry is really to introduce that um, second step where, where there is human intervention until we can get it right. So, um, so like, like you had mentioned before with the heart, um, instead of just, you, now you have 93% accuracy, right? But like before it was just like, well, we see it, <laughs> you know, so like, I don't know what it is, it could be bad, you know, it could just be bad light, <laughs> but, but, but like we, now, now you, ha you have something that's based on data, um, which you, you had mentioned before. Arian, that's a, that's a great point, and I think I'll, I'll revisit this point with, with the scope slightly broader. Uh, I always believe, and I, I have, 
I've been studying the topic of ethics and governance around AI, AI framework and, and how you deploy them, but let's get Ritu's perspective on this first. Now, actually, I agree with both, and like I said, I'm a huge champion of AI, uh, especially for the end user. Uh, I think that AI is going to be embedded in each and every product and function, uh, so it's inevitable. So for example, when you use your cell phone today and tomorrow, um, uh, you know, if you're in a last mile or if you're traveling, uh, you, you may be able to see a better picture. You may be able to have a better user experience. You may not even know that AI is being used to uh, bridge the frames that are being projected on your screen in order for you to be able to look in, uh, to see the pictures and to sh see the videos as though they are fully being streamed while they actually might be uh, updated on your device. Um, so on the uh, you know on, on your device as well as in the cloud, there may be instances where AI is being used. Uh, all the time, uh, so it's going to be inevitable. At the same time, um, today's AI is based on a certain methodology. It is based on disco data discovery, so the AI discovers the data that's being provided, and, and, and uh, it, it's useful that way, but I agree that um, you know, there are a lot of caveats today uh, from the technology we have today. The reason is because it's only as good as the data it's been trained on, um, and, uh, for example, uh, you know, just, just like they said, um, in, in almost any situation, um, you're going to have issues. So, for example, uh, so, so the only thing that's limited uh, in our life is time. So for productivity, for a professional, it's going to be inevitable to use AI. The amount of da underlying data is too large. That's humanly impossible. Uh, to grapple with, and AI is allowing us to take massive volumes of documents, massive volume, volumes as a professional um, uh, of, uh, of spoken text in the form of Siri, in the form of Google Now, and in the form of uh, Cortana, for example, uh, to take nuances in the data and be able to update us about it without having to uh, you know, read years and years worth of reading of text. Um, so I think that it, in the end user situation, it's, in a, it, it's inevitable and it's integral to the user experience. But at the same time, it's only as good as the data it's trained on. So if it's being used, for example, to make decisions about individuals versus statistics, it's, it's going to have a flaw. Thanks, Ritu. I think, I think Ritu put it up uh, very nicely, and, and that can be a good segue, but I'm glad that at least the four of us out here agree that yeah. it's essential, it's required. Yes, there are some asterisks. Adrian will raise her hand. Yes, there are more than one asterisk, Rahul, out there, uh, looking at the concern, and Ritu did put that uh, AI, just like any other program, uh, is as good as the data you feed to the program, and, and the objective you want to get out of this program. Uh, I believe, like any technology or like any tool out there, it always depends upon how and uh, what you want to do with that. Uh, if we are not using AI, and I'm, this is coming from a CISO whose job is to defend my adversaries are already using it. I know that. I have to just outsmart them. If I don't do that, uh, I am already fighting a losing battle. Uh, I believe, as Ritu just concluded in her opening remarks, AI has been able us as a human race to expedite things which otherwise would have taken us ages. Uh, I'm a firm believer if used in the right manner, uh, we can use AI uh, to make this world a better place. Uh, before I segue, uh, there are numerous examples, and I'll quote one more, just like heart flow. Uh, Aeronation is another small US-based startup firm. Use robotics and AI. All it does is that it run up and down the lane of these large forms gather the data, and then in, out here, the data is the light emitted by, by the flowers or, or the crops being grown. 
a caterpillar on a leaf and a leaf without a caterpillar emits two different light. The light then fed back to the big data tells them how soon the crop can get spoiled or whether it will help the yield. The use of erronation has helped farmers to upload the yield by 180% from the same crop. Now, that's the kind of solution we need to battle the hunger problem of this world. If we can use AI in the right manner, I believe we can make the world a better place. But Ritu also brought in a very key point, the data we feed. So we'll go to Arian with what are your top concerns today with the way AI has been uh, wow. deployed and used? Well, um, that's a good question. So my, my main concern is always around bias, but um, because we, we don't want to be able to amplify um, our biases in, in the data. Um, from where we use. So we really need to understand how we're collecting the data, um, what it means, and make sure that's, that, it, that it's even um, that, and, and used statistically, as you've mentioned before. Um, and uh, I am a, definitely a proponent of AI increasing the efficiencies of business. That's something that's just going to be core to, to business <laughs> in the future. How, um, but one, one of my concerns is the perception that it is re re removing jobs. Um, and like, for example, what I, I don't believe that my use of AI is removing any jobs because they wouldn't be able to do it, right? They, they just won't be able to move at this, uh, or click. <laughs> like, why would you even want to click at this, that pace, you know, and have such a boring, rote job? You know, you would just get carpal tunnel syndrome. I mean, and so, I don't believe it's replacing any jobs. Um, however, I can see how it is, you know, um, and we need to balance that. I think in terms of fighting hunger and farming, I think it's very essential um, because we need to be more efficient and we need to be, uh, and we need to be as clean as possible when, 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 we, when we produce in the future. And so that, that there's gonna be so much, um, so much transformation in that, in that um, area. However, it is also like the place where a lot of labor is. And so um, I don't know how to fix that, <laughs> but it is, it is a concern. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Oliver? Um, personally, I say my only concern in AI would be the human element. Um, so if, if AI is trained correctly, if the data that's provided to the AI is non-biased, then you don't have a problem. But then, again, the human element is always the problem. For example, uh, you got bad actors. Uh, we have all uh, are aware of ransomwares, for example, it, that's, that's been hitting the market and, and changing how businesses uh, interact with security and what's so not. Uh, so AI, can, for example, can be trained to act as a first line of defense security to um, intrusion prevention and detection, for example, would be an AI task that no human can perform. Uh, as good as AI. But the problem also would be when bad actors start using AI for their advantages. Uh, so again, you know, the human element is always uh, the problem that, that can utilize AI for the wrong reasons. And Ritu, before I come to you, I think both of you have, have made some really good point. Uh, my, I will, I'll quote two quick examples. One where the data used to develop the product was incorrect, mm -hmm. I think. Amazon recognition product is a, is a classic example what happened with, with the Super Bowl heroes from New Patriot. Uh, the sheer biasness in the data was, was, was the output. But even the product made with, with good intention, and I will say using the right product, Microsoft, I don't know how many of you know, Microsoft came up with, with a chatbot called Day put it out there, and people made their mission to teach the wrong things. Yeah. And it was a matter of hours that this bot was tweeting some of the things which were so offensive. Hateful. <laughs> so, so that's what I was telling, that if we are not using it, even though with all the good intention you have made a product which, with, with the right data sets, there are adversaries out there which will do whatever it takes to, to get yeah. 
these product, these services behave exactly the opposite way. Right. Uh, so I will like to ponder and have your thought that, and then Ritu will start with you, is that do you believe that a sheer lack of standardized ecosystem or framework around how these product, which we call AI technology, being conceptualized, developed, the data sets being collected, that sheer lack of ethics Absolutely. or governance or a framework, name it whatever you want to call it, or the sheer lack of standardization across the world uh, can be one of the main reasons for, for these issues? I think absolutely. That could be a major reason. What we need to change is not only, uh, or what we need to improve upon is not only uh, the way that we uh, that AI u is using data today, or the amount of data that's used to train, but also the objective functions, the goals that we are optimizing, and the governance rules around it. So I totally agree with that. Um, so uh, YouTube or other uh, you know other uh, engagement uh, mechanisms that we use today, um, if uh, you know Tay from Microsoft, the chatbot which uh, you talked about, Rahul, um, that uh, it, it behaved the way it did simply because it was probably aiming to increase its engagement and it came up with the worst things to say. Um, so I believe that currently ungoverned, uh, AI can be much, much better than what the human can do and at the same time it can be much, much worse. It depends on what it's being asked to do. Um, and uh, and, and there, there needs to be a self-governance from the AI community, but also a set of frameworks or rules around how uh, it, it, it is uh, allowed to create those programs as well. Uh, my, my quick cent, uh, two cents out here is that I look at AI more like genetic engineering. And for some reason, the, the governments around the world are a lot more cautious about how genetics engineering is being used and are, are in other words, giving a blind eye towards AI, which, which is equally or if not more harmful because we have scenarios where the whole nation's perceptions are changing today using fake and deep fake news. Arian? No, I, I totally agree. Um, actually, the third, the third uh, concern I had for AI was actually um, for use in defensive uh, in, in weapons, and that's one of the, that's where you really have to be scared, in my opinion, um, because anyone, any bad actor can <laughs> use it, and everyone can almost create it now because the tools are so easy. And so, uh, yes, like the same way as ethics have for gener genetic engineering, where we don't want to clone humans, you know, and we just and we want to give that free will to, to them to be born. Uh, and like the China doctor who, who went to jail because he crossed it, I think there has to be similar rules. Um, one of the other things we need to adopt, I believe, is inclusion. Um, because as, as, as we know, like, uh, even when you see vaccine roll out, um, you know, it is, it is predominantly heavy in the modern monitoring economies, but, but it has impact all over the world. So we need to we need to include we need to in have inclusion um, when we build it. But I don't know how you would build that into <laughs> other other than ethics and standards that we have. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say there has to be some kind of international governance and laws uh, ba uh, placed on AI. We as a society uh, didn't become what we are today if it wasn't for you know the governments that that oversees our societies and the laws. So the same should be for AI, because we're, we're thinking of computers right now as just computers, but what we need to remember is at one point, AI will be able to think for itself, will be able to determine actions. So there has to be laws that even the AI itself need to follow. And I think that that would be a big deal and something we really <laughs> need to think about. Uh, and both of you made a great point, and, and I think the two, two points out here is, is inclusion, Oliver uh, made it second internationally. I think a prime example of that will be uh, uh, scientific advisory AI-based bot, GPT-3, conceptualized, developed in US, was taught how to talk to 
to people from North America. A telemedicine company took it to France, deployed it, changed English language to French without giving much thought. I think Gary pointed it out in the morning session. And two days after deployment, the bot started suggesting patients under deep depression to go and commit suicide because that's, that's, <laughs> that's actually a good option. <laughs> so there is some serious harm which can happen out there. It's a great case study to, to read out there. Uh, uh, those who want to know, it's GPT-3, uh, that, that was the bot name. Uh, uh, I, I want to take one more question with, with three of you. I think uh, looking at our audience, most of them are, are, are either starting or their own firms or are, are associated. I think with AI, having the right data set is so critical. And on the second hand, we see a whole monopoly by some of the big tech firms on, on this data. What should be the right strategy for this smaller player who, who are actually making the biggest innovation to make sure that they have the right data set to <laughs> test those? So I'm, I'm open out here to hear your thoughts because when I, I looked at it, I could not come up with the right answer. <laughs> No, I, I haven't figured that one out either. I know that there are institutes that are working um, to make more um, to make more standardized data sets than we're using for the, the initial ones. We're just like MIT, you know? <laughs> and so um, we we are. There are places where you can get that. Like when we look at it, we also look at, for example, the different ways that and different generations use different channels and devices to communicate. So we always, when we look at segmentation, we look at behaviors down and nuances related to the generations and those devices. Um, and you look at different channels. Um, oftentimes we, we talk about big data and for example in polling and, um, and voting. And one of the, one of the main pro um, problems and biases that was introduced was actually um, polling that was only done through mobile. And so, and that is one of the pro, uh, and so therefore they were not introducing the other, Older other generations, generations that don't yeah. use mobile to communicate, um, and there and and didn't con uh, include those views, and that that did that is also one of the reasons why their polling was off, you know, and it was completely false. And so, um, it is it is in the data and how you collect it. Where if you think broadly on the different kinds of people, um, it will help. Um, it definitely will help, in my opinion. But I don't know. I don't know how you you institutionalize that. I, I I'm building an institution that has those principles, but I don't know how to replicate. <laughs> and, and I'm still little. Yeah. So. <laughs> how do you work? Uh, Again, I think it goes back to send some standards and laws. Um, so first of all, you, you know, you can teach an AI to, um, you know, look at data sets that whether you're just feeding it or whether it can go on the internet and, and look at it for itself. Um, I, I think there's a lot on the internet that you can find, and I think if an AI is smart enough uh, to be able to go and make sense of that data, it'll be able to say, okay, the data I was fed is incom inconclusive or incomplete. Uh, there's more data that I was uh, able to find. So maybe if you teach the AI to look for itself, to teach itself even more, uh, based on the initial data you gave it, and then it can go up on the internet and look for more data, and then look at the bias or, or what could be considered bias, and, and for, uh, think for itself that, okay, well, maybe I need to include this data too to make it a complete set so I can get the bigger picture. Yeah. Do you have two cents on this? Yeah, uh, this is a very thorny problem, uh, and uh, I don't know if there are any easy solutions uh, at all. Um, I feel as though a lot of people have said that AI is a utility or should be a utility. I almost feel from your question that the underlying data should be the utility, because for a certain price, if you're able to achieve or get standardized data sets, that are balanced and that serve some governing principle, um, then uh, perhaps part of the problem could be solved. Now, obviously, th there's a journey from what we think, uh, you know, in, in everyday life as being biased to actually in making sure that that's reflected in the data. 
But let's say we achieve that. I think that uh, could be part of the solution. Another thing that you alluded about uh, that I strongly believe in as well, you know, big data doesn't have to be the sinecure. Uh, it could be small data. And there are new methods that we're now uh, welcoming into AI, I guess, uh, where uh, with small data, you can start with small data and then grow it, uh, you know, use that as small good data and use that as a seed to create a balanced large data set. You don't have to be the one gathering the data. So in that case, the startups or smaller companies can start with small data, can get some users, can accumulate the data and sift it based on uh, you know, the small data that was golden and then uh, utilize it that way. So I think it's a two-pronged approach. Well, great suggestion. I will add one more, how we are doing within security community is crowdsourcing of data. You come up with a product and if 10 of us agree to that, we are making sure that we gather the data and work out with, with the, that smaller startup, with the, with the data set from different industry to check out the validity. Uh, that's, that's another way of doing it. Uh, um, I'm, I'm glad that, that at least we're getting to a point where we agree to disagree on most of the point, <laughs> that AI is required, it, it, it is essential, uh, but we all agree that it has to be done in a structured manner, uh, and somebody needs to draw that, that larger box or the boundary in which we need to, to play. And then I think on the data side, everybody agreed that we, we need to come up with, with innovation uh, so that uh, everyone has a level playing field. Uh, before I go to the audience for their question, I would like to have one final one minute statement from each one of you, what you think AI will be going in next five years. So Oliver, start with you. Um, well, for me personally, my vision is uh, to integrate AI into everybody's daily life. And what I mean by that is, not just um, data mining or, or you know, looking for statistics or anything like that, but is, uh, for me, the vision is to actually bring it, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody here have seen uh, Iron Man, for example, and we're familiar with Jarvis. Uh, my vision is to actually to bring AI, just like you see in that movie, into everybody's daily life, instead of just being able to talk to a smart speaker or a smartphone or anything like that, I want to try to make it part of everybody, uh, everybody's daily life by integrating it into that human element and making it part of everybody's life. Um, I feel that AI, in AI of the future is going to be indistinguishable from human beings. In the next five years, I believe that it's going to go a long way in, um, ex in eliminating disease almost completely. Um, and also, um, in terms of human-to-human, -human, person to person interactions, it's going to be indistinguishable. Um, and uh, it, we would be able to converse with AI almost the same way as we do with human beings. I think we are going to need an owner for each AI. Uh, whereby there is an accountability tied to the program that we are using. So it's going to be a personal aid. So I, I think that once AI starts harming people, those are, that's when we'll have laws that will, will, will start to establish those guardrails because that's really how our, our system of government works, um, and so, which is horrible, because in a way, <laughs> in a way, like, we're gonna hurt people first, and then we're gonna, um, and then from that, we're gonna learn. But that's exactly how social media is working, right? Um, and that's what, and that's why it took a long time for them to start making rules for that, um, and, but once, once people get hurt, um, that's when the rules will come. But I do see that, I do see that definitely happening in this, in this area. Thank you very much. Uh, I agree to all of you. Uh, I believe uh, I see next five years uh, a continuous integration of AI into our life. Uh, AI and, and associated services have made human life a lot better. Uh, many of us know that the vaccination for COVID-19 was, we were able to develop in such a short period uh, was based on AI models. It helped 
human race to come out of this pandemic sooner than uh, than in past. Uh, even though we all believe it used to take it, years. It, yeah, even though we believe that it it's too late, <laughs> uh, we wanted it like in a week's time. Uh, but I agree to Arian's time. It's high time uh, we start looking at some sort of ethic and governance-based framework to manage uh, the regulation, come up with the regulation of all the things which are going in this field. Uh, uh, the Jarvis, uh, Oliver, you mentioned, I think, happy to share in London, there are two first human scientific robots introduced uh, by, uh, by, and the program is actually funded by, by the UK government. Uh, interestingly, they are called Adam and Eve's. Uh, all they are doing is reading books, literature, trying to conduct scientific experiment, l trying to self-evaluate and improving every time, just like a human being does. I think the end goal is to see, can AI regulate AI? Uh, interesting fact, more to come, it's a journey. Uh, but it's a pleasure talking to all of you. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the session as much as I did. Uh, thank you. and. Open for questions, team. And while the question comes, being a moderator, I'm the last one to answer anything. OK, <laughs> those are the ground rules. Um, so uh, th there seem to be some downsides in AI in terms of right, it's artificial, it's computer, it takes out the human emotion. Uh, I'm speaking in a couple hours on ageism in, in tech, and I came across um, a story that a couple years ago, uh, Google's AI, uh, human resources, or human resources, you know, AI-driven um, platform w was starting to basically discriminate because it identified that, um, you know, men, it, it felt that men made better developers. Anybody who seemed to be a woman or went to women's college or played women's college basketball was automatically eliminated from uh, contention. Um, so it seems like human audit uh, is required. If we start imposing artificially intelligent audits on top of AI platforms, so that it also has potential to get sort of messed up. H how do we you know, come up with a solution where on the one hand, we don't need human audit of AI platforms and ensure that artificial audits are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Can I take that? Even though I said the ground road, okay. <laughs> uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, it's, it's reality that uh, most of the AI-based services out there has some sort of bias built in because uh, the data or the perception of the developers uh, creep into, into the logic behind that. Uh, the bodies are understanding that. Most of you uh, know about GDPR, the, the famous privacy law coming out of in Europe. It actually has a very specific provision that if you are using uh, an automated system to make decision, or doing profiling, it has to be unbiased. So they warrant any automated system, AI-based system or bot, must be audited independently to ensure that it inclu uh, the inclusion is there, uh, it's not biased. So uh, those things have been, uh, uh, people have started recognizing this problem, and uh, it's a good problem to solve, and everybody is working towards that. I, I think what we're forgetting right now is that AI is still at its very early stages. So it's, it's really, think of it as a child. Uh, you know, a child's not born racist or biased, but it's taught to be racist or it's taught to be biased. And, and AI is the same thing right now. So obviously as it grows, as it matures, I, I think, um, and especially with governance like um, mentioned, you, you know, it, we can teach it to, to not be biased. We can teach it not to discriminate and we can teach it to, to look for more data you, you know just like you tell your child don't just write a paper research based on you know one source from the internet you, you got to go to more than one source you got to go to a library you got to collect more data and the more data you have the better so uh, obviously it, it's still at its growing stage and uh, we'll definitely see it mature as it grows
Hello. You guys are talking a lot about bias almost in a malicious way, right? That there's a lot of potential malicious intent with AI. What about just uneducated people, right? AI is a really, really, really powerful tool that's very accessible these days through all the cloud providers, et cetera. So I understand where you guys are coming from saying like, well, you know, we have to put guardrails, we have to do this, we have to do that, right? But what about, you know, your, your, your amateur uh, data scientists, right? I have a whole set of data and I'm just gonna run some AI algorithms that are pre-made for me by one of the cloud providers and then take action on it so you'll have a bias, but it's not malicious, but it's still the wrong bias. Right. How do you guys feel about uneducated AI at this point? Yeah, th for me, I mean, that's what we see now. I mean, that's, that's where you can get the story from Google where the 17-year-old the kid can, you know, I d diagnose breast cancer, right? And so, like, because he wanted to as a project. And, and definitely you'll get a lot of that. Um, but when, but when you're when you're an enterprise, you know, or a big tech, there are, there there. The impact you have on the world is much, so much larger. So you must have a greater sense of corporate social responsibility, and so that, um, as you said, the uh, the 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 audit of unbiased is is amazing. But and also like, you also just want to look for the outcomes that were intended. You know, and then be aware of the out, uh, outcomes that were unintended, and 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 fi and fix those. I mean, you ha uh, it's kind of scary because it, at some point you have to care um, uh, that it that it hurts somebody. You know, like for example, I think the UK education system uses AI to grade grade tests, and they found that AI is way more strict than teachers were, and and um, and partially is because you know. Um, neighborhood, lower income neighborhoods, just they don't use the same kind of grammar, they don't have the same time, they don't have those nuances in the in the system, so they get graded automatically less. And so, um, you know, and then that in, impacts where they go to college, and that impacts the rest of their life. So, but the government has to care enough to, to take it off not, and stop using it, you know, because that of, of those income, of those outcomes. And I don't believe they did. Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I, I mean, I, I assume that you, once you can sue for getting hurt, it's going to change. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that AI is going to enable every single person to be an entrepreneur. And a fundamental way in which people make decisions as professionals or as individuals is by classifying the information that they gather from childhood onwards yeah. and say, okay, this is right, this is wrong. Here are the different kinds of people, here are the different kinds of places, and I'm going to choose those. So bias is just uh, what the negative in manifestation of that tendency, and uh, we just have to find a way to, uh, to uh, you know, govern it uh, or, or to teach AI just as we teach people, just, just as Oliver and I mentioned. I, I think my two cents to both of your answer is that a lot gets said about the advantages and, and how good AI can, can be. I think a, a part of that conversation also should be the ethical piece that let's be cognizant that these are the issues which can in, creep into your program. Let's make sure you test them and validate that you are not introducing this problem. Uh, yes. Um, I have a design question for the panel. I would appreciate your comments or insights. The challenge of how AI and big data can benefit the end users, could it be potentially solved by giving ownership uh, by individual people of AI-based agents to release the data selectively to various big data brokers, AI engines, so that way each user has their own agent, which can then selectively share the data without the user necessarily intervening, but based on their programming of their AI agent. That's actually been worked upon. I think GDPR does give you that uh, power as, as law, where you can define which data needs to go out. You can actually go back uh, and, and that's where m most of the tech industry are now fighting back in Europe 
where they are slightly more stringent about what data you want to give to different major tech players and which attributes of your data. Uh, so if that's what you're saying, yes, uh, it will be a noble way. Uh, but then I think it will all come back to who will design that attribute and whether that attribute or that AI-based agent is, is designed uh, looking at all, all the precautions. Team, any? It kind of reminds me of when we talk about just algorithms and models, you know? <laughs> so you put out, you have like an open source al algorithms and these are like the, the be like best practice. I mean, that's what it kind of sounds like you're, <laughs> you're describing. I mean, I, that's, it sounds cool to me. I, don't, <laughs> I just don't know how to, yeah. But um, yeah, that, that definitely would make sense to, to be able to um, maybe have best practice algorithm models that are already built, say for example, or like a sentiment analysis for children that you know that that's the sentiment that will work. Um, and so you could just apply it to your particular use case rather than trying to test the sentiment of children. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, that, that, I mean, it sounds cool. Like, like if you're willing to share your algorithms. Well, At team, this point, right, that's kind we of We are hard. running out of time. Yeah. So apologies. <laughs> uh, we are here. Uh, we can yeah. you know, catch us uh, during the networking session. Thank you. We enjoyed your questions. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.